On June 3, 1920, 102 years ago today, the U.S. commissioned what was described at the time as the largest and most formidable battleship afloat. USS Tennessee was the first of the so-called standard-type battleships to be built too late to see service in the Great War, and yet she was already an aged vessel when she sat next to USS West Virginia in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December 7, 1941. But not only would Big Ten survive that battle, she would go on to serve in more battles than any other battleship of the U.S. in the Second World War. The service of USS Tennessee is history that deserves to be remembered. The U.S. standard-type battleships represented American naval thinking in the early 20th century. The idea of the standard type was that battleship designs, while still able to integrate innovations, would be tactically homogenous. That is, new U.S. battleships would be designed to have the same top speed, 21 knots, and tactical turning radius, 700 yards. Thus, ships of different classes would be able to act as a tactical unit. Unlike other navies, whose battleships would have to be either limited to the performance of the slowest ship or have separate fast and slow battle wings. USS Nevada was the first of the standard-type battleships, laid down in November 1912 and commissioned in March 1916. Seven standard-type battleships, two Nevada-class, two Pennsylvania-class, and three New Mexico-class were designed before the Battle of Jutland. For the next class of battleships, called Battleship 16, as the design would be finalized in 1916, the Navy wanted to deviate from the standard type to incorporate lessons from the battle. That would be the Tennessee class. The Navy General Board wanted to do more than the incremental changes of the standard type, but Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels was concerned about cost and overruled the board. The two ships of the Tennessee class would be standard type designs, incorporating incremental improvements over the previous New Mexico class. Among the improvements were better defense below the waterline using torpedo bulkheads to protect from long-range torpedoes. And while the class would mount 12 of the same 14-inch 50 caliber main guns used by the New Mexico class in four triple-gun turrets, the turrets were raised, allowing the guns to depress to 30 degrees, greatly increasing the gun's maximum range by more than five and a half miles over the New Mexico class to more than 20 miles. Three more standard-type battleships of the Colorado class were produced after Tennessee and California. The class, limited by the naval treaties, mounted eight 16-inch main guns rather than 12 14-inch guns. More modern than the previous ships of the standard type, the Navy referred to the two Tennessee class and three Colorado class ships as the Big Five. Tennessee was built at New York's Brooklyn Naval Yard, laid down May 14, 1917, and launched in April 1919. When she was commissioned, June 3, 1920, the Lincoln, Nebraska Star wrote that she is the next thing to the pleasure yacht in the comfort of her appointments for officers and men. Notably, the paper reported, Tennessee was also the first battleship to recruit her entire personnel from the state, from which it takes its name. The Newton, Kansas Evening Kansan Republican wrote that the Tennessee represented the highest type in the development of the dreadnought class of sea fighters. With its crew of more than a thousand men standing at attention, the paper reported, the super dreadnought Tennessee, the latest and greatest of Uncle Sam's fighting ships, was placed in commission at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. When commissioned, the Tennessee was 642 feet long, with a beam of 97 feet 5 inches, and displaced 32,300 long tons. She had initial difficulties. In October 1920, one of the ship's electric generators exploded, destroying the turbine and necessitating repairs that lasted until February 1921. After completing sea trials in June, she was assigned to the U.S. Pacific Fleet and transited the Panama Canal. Tennessee, along with the rest of the fleet, participated in regular training exercises, and it was those exercises that demonstrated the flaw in the standard type theory, block obsolescence. Since the 12 ships have been designed around being tactically homogenous, when the tactical design became outdated, the entire battleship fleet became obsolete at once, a difficult problem since replacing that number of ships would take years. Notably, fleet exercises demonstrated the importance of aircraft carriers. The standard-type battleships could not keep up with the faster aircraft carriers, creating quite a hindrance to operations. The next class after the Colorado class, the North Carolina class, would be so-called fast battleships capable of 28 knots. The Japanese super battleships Yamato and Musashi were built specifically to outclass the U.S. standard-type battleship fleet. Still, the Naval Encyclopedia writes, 
On December 6, 1941, the U.S. Navy was confident, despite two coastlines to defend and a few overseas possessions, the fleet's hopes rested on no less than 20 battleships, at the time the largest capital ship's force worldwide. In late 1940, the Pacific Fleet, then called the Battle Forces, was relocated from San Pedro, California to the U.S. Naval Base at Pearl Harbor, a move intended to deter Japanese aggression. The morning of December 7th, Tennessee was on Battleship Row on the southeastern side of Ford Island at the key called Fox 6, moored alongside USS West Virginia. Arizona was astern, Maryland ahead, both approximately 75 feet distance. As Japanese planes started bombing Ford Island, the ship went to general quarters. Tennessee's position left her unable to maneuver, but West Virginia alongside prevented her from being attacked by torpedoes while smoke from USS Arizona and West Virginia obscured the ship from attacking planes. But her position also meant that the men of the Tennessee were in a unique position to view the battle. Shortly after the battle, Sergeant Major Roger Emmons of the Tennessee's Marine Detachment wrote an account. The alarm gong sounded general quarters. I was so surprised I could hardly believe my ears, but the noise of explosions through the open ports forced it upon me. My battle station was on the five-inch broadside guns, where I could see what was actually happening around us. The sky was dotted with black puffs of anti-aircraft fire. A plane trailing a plume of smoke was plunging earthward over Fort Island. Off in the direction of Schofield Barracks, there was a vast cloud of black smoke. At the same time, two billowing pillars of smoke arose from the Navy Yard and the Hickam Field area. From his position, the Sergeant Major was able to observe the attack on USS Arizona. At about 8 a.m., a terrific explosion took place in our next astern, Arizona, which fairly lifted us in the water. She blew up in an enormous flame and a cloud of black smoke when her forward magazine exploded after a Japanese bomb had dropped down her funnel. Her back broken by the explosion, the entire forward portion of the ship canted away from the aft portion as the ship began to settle at the bottom. It was a scene which cannot easily be forgotten. The Arizona was a mass of fire from bow to foremast, on deck and between decks. And the surface of the water for a large distance around was a mass of flaming oil from millions of gallons of fuel oil. Over a thousand dead men lay in her twisted wreck. The bombs that had destroyed Arizona were armored-piercing bombs, actually converted large-caliber naval shells. Two of the same kind of bombs struck Tennessee, but fortunately neither one fully exploded. The attack continued. Emmons wrote, A few moments after this disaster, our attention was absorbed in the Oklahoma, stabbed several times in her port side by torpedoes. She heeled very gently over and capsized within nine minutes. The water was dotted with the heads of men. Some swam ashore, covered from head to foot with thick, oily scum, but hundreds had been trapped in the vessel's hull, were drowned. We had only been in the attack a few minutes when the West Virginia, about 20 feet on our port beam, began slowly to settle by the bow and then took a heavy list to port. She had been badly hit by several torpedoes in the opening attack. In the midst of all this turmoil, the Nevada, the next ship astern of the blazing Arizona, got underway and headed for the Channel. As she moved downstream, the vessel was a target of many enemy planes, until badly crippled by a torpedo, and after that she ran aground to prevent sinking. The Tennessee was pinned to the quay by the listing USS West Virginia. She had several fires aboard, and the sea around was all burning oil. The real story of this ship, Emmons wrote, lies in the splendid manner in which the officers and men on board arose to the emergency. When general quarters was sounded, all hands dashed to their battle stations. There was no panic. The shock found each and every man ready for his job. Anti-aircraft and machine guns were quickly manned, the first gun getting into action in less than three minutes after the alarm. For the next 40 minutes, the Tennessee was the center of a whirlwind of bombs and bullets. The Japanese planes bombed our ship and then bombed again. They opened up with machine guns and low-flying attacks. The ship's gun crews fought with utmost gallantry and in the most tenacious and determined manner. Hostile planes swooping down on what they thought was easy prey were greeted with volleys from our anti-aircraft and machine guns. And after such a warm reception, the Japanese ever gave the Tennessee a wide berth. It's difficult to write clearly of the details of this attack, for the whole thing outdid the most imaginative picture of a battle. The Japs dive-bombed our ships again and again while low-flying planes, no more than 100 feet above the water, strafed the gun crews. They flew to the end of the bay, made a turn, and came back. A terrible scene of destruction was revealed to me as I took a general look around. The West Virginia, just a beam of us, was blazing furiously. Only the bottom of Oklahoma was visible. The Arizona was an inferno now, emitting dense volumes of smoke which hung over the harbor like a funeral pall. 
our next ahead, Maryland, was hit by a large bomb on the forecastle, which penetrated the deck and made an ugly hole in her port bow. An armored piercing bomb had exploded in one of the casemates of the Pennsylvania. Looking towards the California, I noticed that she had a heavy list to the port side. Tennessee had taken damage. Two of her main turrets were disabled. Four crew were killed, and her hull was buckled from the heat. The captain, Charles E. Reardon, a 1909 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, ordered the ship forward to separate her from the burning oil. While the ship proved unable to move, the turning screws pushed the flaming oil back, possibly saving the ship. Still, some plates were so buckled from the heat that the ship needed repairs before it could get underway to the West Coast for repair and refit. On December 20th, she put to sea with Maryland and Pennsylvania. She underwent significant refit and modernization at Puget Sound Naval Yard. She had additional torpedo blisters added, and her anti-aircraft guns were significantly modified and upgraded, giving her a more modern appearance. She returned to service in May 1943. Still, Tennessee faced the same obstacles that had been obvious even before Pearl Harbor. She couldn't keep up with the aircraft carriers and the long-range attacks that characterized the war in the Pacific. After their originally envisioned role as a battle line and a fleet engagement was not to be, the ships of the standard type would find a new role, using their powerful main guns and secondary 5-inch armament supporting amphibious landings. And none would do so more than Tennessee. Tennessee's first bombardment duty was in August, supporting efforts to retake the Alaskan island of Kiska. The pounding of her 5- and 14-inch shells turned out to be unnecessary as ground forces landed on the island discovered that the Japanese had secretly abandoned the island in July. But her guns would have more effect in November, where she and Colorado supported the invasion of Tarawa, a battle in which the Navy learned valuable lessons about pre-invasion bombardment. Tennessee put those lessons to use. In January, she and Pennsylvania supported the invasion of Kwajalein Atoll. In February, Colorado joined Pennsylvania and Tennessee supporting the invasion of Inouetic Atoll in the Marshall Islands. In March, she joined three New Mexico-class battleships bombarding Caving Island in the Bismarck Archipelago. In June, her guns supported the invasion of Saipan. In July, the invasions of Guam and Tinian. In August, she supported the invasion of the island of Anguar and Peleliu in the Palau Islands. In October, she bombarded Japanese positions, supporting the invasion of the Philippine island of Leyte. The night of October 25th, she was in the battle line in the Sirigao Strait, firing six salvos at the battleships Yamashiro and Megami. It was the last engagement between battleships in history. She narrowly avoided a collision with her sister ship, California, after California's captain misinterpreted an order to turn. The following February, Tennessee spent two weeks supporting the invasion of Iwo Jima, where she fired 1,370 14-inch shells and 6,385-inch rounds. On March 26, Tennessee was one of the first ships to fire in the pre-invasion bombardment in the terrible Battle of Okinawa. The next day, she experienced the waves of kamikaze attacks that defined the naval battle off the island. She escaped damage that day, but on April 12th, one got through, crashing into her signal bridge, killing 22 and injuring 107. She underwent emergency repairs, but was back on station two days later. After support for the occupation and various duties, Tennessee returned to the United States via the Cape of Good Hope because the torpedo blisters that had been added to her in 1942 made her too large to transit the Panama Canal. She arrived at the Philadelphia Naval Yard on December 7th, 1945, exactly four years after she had survived the attack on Pearl Harbor. In that time, the guns of the Big Ten had participated in 13 major battles, more than any other U.S. battleship, earning 10 battle stars and a presidential unit citation. She had spent 339 days in combat areas, expended more than 9,000 14-inch rounds, and fired, according to the Museum of Scott County, Tennessee, which still displays the ship's bell and other memorabilia, more volleys than any other ship in the Second World War. Decommissioned in 1947, despite her age, Tennessee was placed in the U.S. Reserve Fleet. She was stricken from the rolls in March 1959. A brief effort by the state of Tennessee to acquire and preserve her as a museum ship failed when it was decided that she was unable to travel up the Mississippi River. She was sold for scrap and broken up in July. The website About Pearl Harbor notes that while not as widely recognized as USS Arizona, the Tennessee's survival during the attack on Pearl Harbor proved paramount to the success of the United States Navy in World War II. At the beginning of July 1945, the war in the Pacific was almost over, but the Allies didn't know that yet. 
The grueling three-month Battle of Okinawa had just concluded at the end of June and had cost the Allies some 75,000 casualties, killed or wounded, had damaged 400 Allied ships, shot down 700 Allied aircraft. If Imperial Japan was on the ropes, they certainly seemed to have a lot of fight still left in them. And the Allies were already planning Operation Downfall, the proposed invasion of the Japanese home islands for that November. The predictions were bleak, with some of the estimates assuming that the Allies would take as many as a million casualties to take the home islands. In preparation for that attack, in July the Allies began the first major naval bombardment operation against the Japanese home islands. Over the course of the next month, some eight battleships, a dozen cruisers, and numerous destroyers would attack military and industrial targets in the last major naval operation of the Second World War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. There were many reasons behind the decision to engage in naval bombardment of the home islands. Japan had been under sustained attack from B-29 Super Fortress bombers flying from the Mariana Islands since the fall of 1944, but significant industrial targets in the north lay outside the range of the bombers. The massive Allied fleet, the U.S. alone could field 23 battleships in 1945, could attack some of the few remaining facilities of Japanese industry that hadn't been crippled by aerial bombing. Allied command concluded that after the air losses at Okinawa, more than 1,400 Japanese aircraft had been lost in the battle, most used in kamikaze attacks, the Allied heavy ships, which had largely been used as escorts for carriers, would have relative freedom to attack. Japan coastal defenses were estimated to be light, offering little risk to the ships. The Allies were hoping to avoid the invasion by convincing the Japanese that further resistance was futile, and naval bombardment was seen as part of a combined strategy with the aerial bombing to demoralize the population. And finally, the hope was that the attacks would draw out the few remaining Japanese air and naval assets, exposing them to destruction ahead of the invasion. An Army Pictorial Service newsreel said of the operation, a naval intelligence report states that for a year, as Japan has been scourged by Allied warplanes, northern Honshu and Hokkaido have provided a haven for aircraft, shipping, railroads, and industries. Bombardment from the sea, coupled with strikes by planes from the carriers of Task Force 38, will now end this isolation. A December 2018 edition of the Navy Times explains, Third Fleet's objective was to apply relentless violence in hopes that Japan would stand down, but if not, lay destructive groundwork for an invasion. The initial striking force would be drawn from the U.S. Third Fleet under the command of Fleet Admiral William Halsey and the fleet's main strike element, Task Force 38, under the command of Vice Admiral John S. McCain, Sr. Task Force 38 was the fast carrier task force and included 17 aircraft carriers and six battleships. The group of fast attack carriers had played a critical role throughout the war in the Pacific since it had been created in August 1943. The task force battleships were the so-called fast battleships, battleships of the North Carolina, South Dakota, and Iowa classes, capable of making more than 27 knots to keep up with the Essex-class carriers of the task force, and mounting 16-inch main guns that could fire 2,700-pound shells a distance of up to 23 miles. The attacks would later include elements of the Royal Navy and the Royal New Zealand Navy. Allied submarines approached the home islands, searching out targets and naval mines. Allied aircraft reconnoitered targets while suppressing the Japanese ability to reconnoiter the American fleet. McCain's force sortied from the Philippines on July 1st. The task force was immense. By itself, it commanded more firepower than any other Navy in history. The Navy Times reported, The power and personnel on the decks and in the ready rooms of the three task groups embodied years of planning, design, production, testing, recruiting, training, deployment, and combat experience. The first attacks came from the task force air groups. The Navy Times describes the initial attacks. As a Japanese aircraft carrier armada had when nearing Hawaii in early December 1941, Task Force 38 used a weather front to mask its July 9, 1945 approach to Honshu. At 2 a.m. the next morning, the three task groups emerged, launched planes, and slipped back into the front to avoid counterattack. Weeks of elaborate planning paint hams and dividends. Virtually unopposed, even flak was meager, American pilots pummeled 12 Tokyo air airfields, destroying some 109 ground-based planes and damaging 231. The battleships arrived on July 14th, coordinating with another attack by aircraft from the task force. The attempt to draw out the Japanese air forces failed, and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters kept the planes in reserve. But this left the Imperial Japanese Navy vulnerable. U.S. submarines had severed most supply lines, and the Navy had no fuel to operate. Its remaining ships were stuck in port, unable to maneuver and without air cover.
The planes of the task force rained fire on the nearby defenseless vessels, sinking 11 warships and damaging 8 more, as well as sinking or damaging scores of merchant vessels. The Imperial Japanese Navy would suffer many more losses to the planes of Task Force 38 over the coming weeks. Meanwhile, the battleships USS South Dakota, Indiana, and Massachusetts, the heavy cruisers USS Quincy in Chicago, and nine destroyers targeted the ironworks at Kamaishi in northern Honshu. Kamaishi was a major foundry town that included an iron mill run by the Japan Iron and Steel Company. The mill, which had been founded in 1880, was one of the largest mills operated by Japan's largest iron producer. According to a 1968 paper written for East Central State College, Oklahoma, the mill had produced its peak production in 1943 when it had produced 426,000 tons of pig iron and semi-finished steel, although by the summer of 1945 a shortage of coking coal and other materials had the mill running at less than half capacity. At 10.55 in the morning, the task group flagship USS South Dakota hoisted a signal. It read, Never forget Pearl Harbor. Reporter James Lindsley of the San Bernardino County Sun was on board the South Dakota. He wrote, High explosives bearing Made in America stamp whistled for two hours from flaming muzzles of big navy guns into the great Japanese ironworks at Kamiishi in northern Hanzu today. It was my privilege to watch the bombardment of Japan for the first time in this war, a bombardment which caused sky-reaching explosions and started roaring fires which blanketed the area with smoke. Admiral Samuel Morrison chronicled the effect in his landmark 1960 work, The History of the United States Naval Operations in World War II. Firing commenced at 12.10 p.m. from a range of 29,000 yards, and over the course of a two-hour bombardment, the group fired 802 16-inch shells, 728 8-inch shells, and 825 5-inch shells. Morrison explains that the concussion from all the firing caused kitchen fires to spread throughout the city of some 40,000 residents. An August 2020 edition of the Japan Times wrote that much of the bombardment targeted a local iron mill run by Japan Iron and Steel Company, but the entire city burned to the ground. The Times quoted Kinji Sano, who was 14 at the time of the attack. Soon we began to hear the crackling sound more vividly. I thought it was the rain, but when I peeped outside there were no ripples in the pond in our garden. When I looked back, our house was engulfed in flames. We jumped out from the shelter. Sano ran to another shelter, which also caught fire and eventually escaped, running over a hill. When the attack ended, he told the Times, he went back to find out that his home had been burned to the ground. It was the second time his home had been destroyed. It had been washed away in a tsunami in 1933, when he was just two years old. Another survivor, Toko Wada, was quoted on the Japan Economic Newswire in 2015, comparing the devastation of the city to the 2011 tsunami there. The distressing scene was the same at the time. Wada, who was 15 when the city was bombarded, said recently in a room at a nursing home for the aged in Kamaishi, the whole town was gone. I got choked up inside as I thought I'd never wanted to see it that way again. Smoke from the fires prevented naval aircraft from spotting for the ships, but they were able to continue their fire on predetermined targets. Most remarkably, the ships saw virtually no opposition, with no coastal fire or planes responding. The only military response was from a small submarine chaser in the harbor, sunk quickly by naval gunfire. The fleet was so confident that radio silence was not maintained. The headline in the sun read, Yank ships swagger back and forth off Japanese coast. The Allies did not even attempt to hide the names of the ships involved. The bombardment did significant damage to the mill, although the full extent wasn't known until after the war. The fires destroyed more than 1,400 homes and killed more than 400 civilians. There would have been no Allied casualties that night, except that, unknown to the Allies at the time, British and Dutch prisoners of war were being used as slave labor at the factory. Five were killed in the bombardment. And ships of the task force were already moving into position for another attack. The battleships USS Iowa, Missouri, and Wisconsin, along with the light cruisers Atlanta and Dayton, moved into position the night of the 14th, and began an attack on another steel mill outside the town of Moron on Hokkaido firing 860 16-inch shells and severely damaging the mill's operation. Halsey himself was present for the attack, aboard his flagship, USS Missouri. Two days later, Iowa, Missouri, and Wisconsin were joined by North Carolina, Alabama, and HMS King George V for an attack on the Honshu city of Hitachi, a center of electronics manufacturing. The Melbourne Australian newspaper The Age noted that the addition of HMS King George V meant that the British fleet shelled Japan for the first time. And the bombardment force, as in earlier shellings, acted in complete disdain of the enemy's navy and air force. One correspondent, broadcasting from a battleship, the paper wrote, said the third fleet was pouring shells in at a rate of 50,000 pounds a minute.
While the battleships fired over 1,500 shells from their 16 and 14 inch guns, rain and fog made targeting difficult. The bombardment did more damage to the city's residential area than to the industrial area. A raid the next day by B-29s using incendiary bombs resulted in near total destruction of the city's urban area. The results of the bombardments have been decidedly mixed. While the damage to facilities was not as severe as had been hoped, and the actions had failed to draw out the remaining air assets as Allied planners had hoped, Japan had proven virtually defenseless. A June 2020 edition of The National Interest concludes, The attacks incurred no Japanese response, seemed to have inflicted some damage, so Admiral William Halsey decided to continue them. The fleet moved to regroup and resupply. Samuel J. Cox, the director of the Naval History and Heritage Command, wrote in 2020, on 21-22 July, 3rd Fleet conducted what is probably the largest single replenishment at sea operation in history. Over 100 ships received 6,369 tons of ammunition, 379,157 barrels of fuel oil, 1,635 tons of stores and provisions, 99 replacement aircraft, and 412 replacement personnel from the oilers, ammunition ships, store ships, and escort carriers of Task Group 30.8, commanded by Rear Admiral Donald B. Beery, an unsung hero, World War II. It's telling that at this point in the war, fueling the fleet was a greater challenge than facing the enemy. The, the risk of a typhoon was a greater concern than the Imperial Japanese Navy. The bombardments continued, including a second attack on Kamiishi in August that killed more civilians and POWs. Several air raids on the naval base at Kure, Japan in the latter part of July damaged or destroyed most of what was left of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Admiral McCain opposed the attacks, finding them unnecessary and fearing risk to his pilots at a base with a strong anti-air defense, but Nimitz wanted the threat neutralized. The night of July 22nd and 23rd, a group of destroyers attacked and sank a Japanese freighter. Two small Japanese naval vessels, a minesweeper and a subchaser, briefly engaged the U.S. destroyers, but didn't damage them. That was the last substantial surface engagement between the U.S. and Imperial Japanese navies. Despite the continued attacks, the war was, of course, at its end. The last attack on Kamiishi occurred on August 9th, the same day a B-29 called Boxcar dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. But there was still more death to come in the waning days of the war. Task Force planes were in the air the morning of August 15th when word arrived that the Emperor had agreed to surrender. The planes were recalled, but several were attacked by Japanese planes, either pilots who had not been informed of the sea's fire or who were too fanatical to accept surrender. Knowing there could still be a risk from kamikazes, Halsey gave the order to shoot any aircraft approaching the fleet down, in a friendly manner. At least five Allied pilots died in air battles that day. More than 30 Japanese planes were shot down. It was the last substantial air battle of the Second World War. While Japan had officially surrendered, it took a long time for that word to spread, and combat operations continued in Manchuria, in China, in Southeast Asia. It's really unclear who fired the last shots of the war in the Pacific. Analysis after the war found that the naval bombardment had done more damage to industry than initially had been suspected, but that even the 16-inch naval guns didn't do as much damage as the 1 and 2,000 pound bombs of the naval aircraft. Admiral McCain made his opinion clear. He thought that the aircraft that had been assigned to defend the battleships would have done more damage than the battleships themselves. It was determined that the naval bombardment had a significant impact on the population's morale, but it appears that the Japanese high command didn't pay much attention to the morale of the populace and that the naval bombardment didn't play any significant role in the eventual decision to surrender. It can certainly be argued that the entire operation was unnecessary and in fact might have been motivated more by revenge than strategic purposes. The deployment of the battleship certainly represents an ironic twist as the war had started with the Japanese sinking U.S. battleships at Pearl Harbor. Still, the U.S. could not have known what military pressure was necessary to compel the Japanese to surrender. Still, the battleships did themselves little favors. As the national interest notes, the raids were only successful because Japan was almost completely prostrate from a military sense. Against a better resourced foe, the magazine argues, even the battleships would have had trouble defending themselves from submarines and air attacks. And thus, the raids offered no plausible logic to retain large numbers of battleships. But a few did remain and found service. The last two battleships, USS Iowa and USS Wisconsin, were not stricken from the U.S. naval roles until 2006. In 1990, a coalition of 35 nations went to war over the invasion and occupation of Kuwait by Iraq.
The Gulf War was a war of modern technologies that tested and sometimes debuted some of the most cutting edge technologies of modern warfare. Things like stealth aircraft and laser guided smart bombs, hyper accurate radar air and ground surveillance systems, advanced infrared imaging systems that required no light source at all, out of line of sight satellite communications, remote aerial vehicles and all sorts of technologies defined the war that became called the video game war. But in this war of new technologies, there were some venerable weapon systems that many thought were past their prime, maybe even past their time, that still showed their worth. Two veterans of wars long past lent their mighty voices, which had not been heard in combat for decades, to the Gulf War, leading to a startling first and a nostalgic finale for warfare. The end of the era of the battleship is history that deserves to be remembered. The era of the battleship was already waning by the time the battleships of the Iowa class were commissioned. The class of fast battleships was originally envisioned as a group that was heavy enough to participate in the battle line, but fast enough to protect supply lines. They were a response to fast battleships, especially the Congo class of the Imperial Japanese Navy, which it was feared could attack the Navy along its lines of supply, outgun protective cruisers, and yet be too fast for slower battleships of the line to bring to battle. As designed, the ships of the Iowa class could make 33 knots and had a main armament of nine 16-inch 50 caliber guns, more powerful than the 16-inch 45 caliber guns used on the preceding South Dakota and North Carolina classes whose barrels were 80 inches shorter. 887 feet long with a displacement of 57,540 long tons fully loaded, their superstructure stood 15 stories high. They were the largest battleship ever built by the United States, 207 feet longer than the South Dakota class, yet still having a beam of 108 feet, narrow enough to traverse the Panama Canal. By the time the first ship of the class, the USS Iowa, BB-61, was commissioned in February of 1943, the idea of fast battleships had already changed. Although there were a few battleship versus battleship encounters of the war, it was already obvious that naval combat was no longer defined by a battle line of heavy battleships, but that the future was in naval aviation, where great fleet battles would occur without the ships ever coming within sight of each other. While battleships still played an important role in fire support, their fleet role had changed to escorting the new fast Essex-class aircraft carriers. Four ships of the Iowa class were initially envisioned. Later, an additional two battleships, originally intended to be built as the heavier Montana class, were assigned to be built to the Iowa design. Iowa was commissioned in February of 1943 in New Jersey the following May. The next two, Missouri and Wisconsin, were both ordered in June of 1940, and laid down in January of 1941. Wisconsin launched on December 7, 1943, two years to the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The final two, Illinois and Kentucky, were still under construction at the end of the war and were never completed, making the Missouri and Wisconsin the last U.S. battleships ever built. They weren't the last battleship ever built. HMS Vanguard of the Royal Navy was commissioned in 1946 and never saw combat. But they were among the last of the ships that had once defined the Navy's prestige, but had been displaced by new technology. The Iowa-class battleships saw combat throughout the Pacific campaigns, defending the fleet against air attacks and using their massive guns to support troops landing on enemy beaches. On September 2nd, 1945, Missouri, by then affectionately nicknamed the Mighty Mo, was the location of the ceremony where representatives of the Empire of Japan signed the Japanese Instrument of Surrender officially marking the end of hostilities of the Second World War. Iowa was also in the bay that day. Three days later, Wisconsin, called the Whiskey, entered Tokyo Harbor, part of the occupying force. New Jersey, the Big J, arrived on the 17th and served as the flagship of the naval forces in Japanese waters. Among them, the Iowa-class battleships earned 26 battle stars during their relatively brief service in World War II. After the war, there was disagreement as to the need to maintain battleships. All of the classes of battleships prior to the Iowa class were too slow to keep up with the fleet carriers, now the centerpiece of the Navy. While they had some post-war duties, transporting troops or as training ships, by 1947 all had been decommissioned, placed in reserve fleets, scrapped, or used in testing nuclear weapons. 
1947, Iowa was part of a group assigned to sink the decommissioned USS Nevada, which had been sunk at Pearl Harbor, refloated, participated in the D-Day landings, and then survived not one, but two nuclear tests at Bikini Atoll. But even the Iowa class, the most modern battleships in the Navy, proved just too expensive to keep in service. By 1948, all but the Missouri had been placed into the reserve fleets. Reserve fleets are often called mothball fleets, or places where ships are kept maintained enough to stay afloat in case they need to be recommissioned in time of an emergency. But in practice, very few ships in history have ever been recommissioned after being placed in mothballs. As Congress and military planners discussed possible roles and conversions for the remaining battleships, Missouri was the only commissioned U.S. battleship after 1948. Some argue because President Truman had a soft spot for the ship, which had been christened by his daughter, Margaret. But the Second World War had given way to the Cold War, and perhaps the largest proxy war of the Cold War started in June of 1950, when troops from North Korea crossed the 38th parallel into South Korea. The South Korean army, poorly equipped and caught by surprise, was decimated in a matter of days. The U.S. military had been greatly reduced following the end of the Second World War, but was deploying the first troops to assist South Korea before the end of June. In addition to land and air units, the U.S. deployed a significant fleet to support U.N. forces defending South Korea. Among them was the nation's last battleship, USS Missouri, arrived in September. Missouri's 16-inch guns played critical roles in supporting the landings at Incheon that turned the tide of the war, and then the following December in covering the retreat of UN forces as the intervention by the People's Republic of China turned the tide yet again. In November, New Jersey was reactivated, and Wisconsin and Iowa returned to service in 1951. Iowa engaged in so many fire support missions in Korea that she earned the nickname the Grey Ghost. The ships of the Iowa class continued to rotate through service in the conflict until the end of hostilities in 1953. New Jersey earned four battle stars for the Korean conflict. Missouri earned three, Iowa two, and Wisconsin earned one. While their fire support capabilities with their massive 16-inch guns were impressive, the enemy simply learned to not put important targets that close to shore. Heavy cruisers proved to be almost as effective at shore bombardment and were far less expensive to operate. Despite their distinguished service during the war, the Korean conflict left the Navy less convinced than ever that it was worthwhile to maintain the high cost of operating battleships. By 1958, all four of the Iowa-class battleships were back in mothballs. There was a noteworthy incident in this period. In May 1956, the Wisconsin collided with the Fletcher-class destroyer USS Eaton in heavy fog off the Virginia Capes. Both ships were damaged severely. The Eaton's keel was broken, and the bow was only saved by securing an anchor chain bow to stern. Wisconsin took significant damage to her bow, leaving the question whether the ship should be maintained. However, the hulk USS Kentucky, the Iowa-class battleship that had never been finished, was kept as a parts hulk. Kentucky's bow was removed whole and used to replace Whiskey's damaged bow. At this point, it seemed like the argument had turned against the costly battleships. By 1962, all of the remaining battleships, except for the four Iowa class, had been removed from the reserve fleets. Most had been scrapped, while a handful were given to various organizations as museum ships. In 1968, the Navy briefly reactivated the New Jersey, which of the Iowa class had had the most recent refit to use in the Vietnam conflict. By then, New Jersey was the only active battleship left in the world. It was hoped that her heavy guns could replace some air missions, reducing the air losses in the conflict. The cost of maintaining the vessel and crew, however, proved prohibited. She served one tour and was deactivated again in 1969. But the day of the battleship had not ended. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president, and his platform included a significant increase in the size and capabilities of the U.S. Navy. This is part of a strategy that Reagan described as peace through strength, the idea of promoting peace via a strong deterrence and the underlying goal of winning the Cold War by bankrupting Moscow in an arms race. In 1980, the USSR commissioned the first Kirov-class nuclear-powered heavy missile cruiser. At 827 feet, the ships of the Kirov class were the size of World War I battleships and the largest surface combatant ships active in the world at the time, smaller only than large aircraft carriers and amphibious assault ships. The administration, intent on bringing the U.S. fleet up to 600 ships, wanted a response. The decision was to modernize and reactivate the four Iowa-class battleships that had been in mothballs for nearly 30 years. The ship's engines were modified to use new fuel. Their electronics and anti-aircraft systems were replaced with modern electronic warfare suites and close-in weapon systems. They were modified to carry Harpoon and Tomahawk missile systems. 
They're equipped with the RQ-2 Pioneer unmanned aerial vehicle, acting as a spotter for their 16-inch guns, which, despite some discussion of replacing them, were retained. Their fire accuracy greatly enhanced with the modern Mark 160 fire control system. Despite their age, the refit was reasonably cost-effective, with the Navy spending a total of some $1.7 billion to bring the four ships back into service, roughly the cost of building four new Oliver Hazard Perry-class frigates. New Jersey's guns were fired as part of an intervention in the 1983 Lebanese Civil War. Iowa suffered a catastrophic turret explosion in its number two turret in 1989. Despite sending some $25 million on two investigations, the cause of the explosion could not be definitely determined. 47 crew were killed, one of the most deadly events during peacetime in the history of the United States Navy. Iowa was again decommissioned December of 1990 and New Jersey in February 1991. But Missouri and Wisconsin had another war to fight. On August 2nd, 1990, the Iraqi army invaded and occupied the neighboring country of Kuwait. The move brought international condemnation and a coalition of nations to support the military response. The response included the world's last two active battleships. Missouri arrived in the Gulf first, making its first attacks with missiles on January 17th. On January 30th, for the first time since 1953 and more than 46 years after the ship had been commissioned, the 16-inch guns of USS Missouri were fired in anger, showing a command and control bunker near the Saudi border. Wisconsin relieved Missouri in February, firing her guns in a fire support mission against Iraqi artillery, the first time that they had been used in combat since March of 1952. Later in February, both ships participated in an important mission, simulating a planned amphibious assault. The fate tied up some 80,000 Iraqi troops. Assigned to bombard entrenched troops on Kuwait's Felaka Island after being pounded by Missouri's 16-inch guns, throwing 1,900-pound high-explosive shells, Wisconsin flew her unmanned aerial vehicle over the trenches, deliberately low, so that the Iraqi troops would know what was coming. Terrified of more bombardment by the massive battleships, Iraqi troops showed white flags to the tiny spotter vehicle. The first known time in war that enemy troops surrendered to an unmanned aircraft controlled by a ship. The company that built the aircraft described the event as the first electronic capture in history. Before the end of hostilities later that month, Missouri and Wisconsin each had fired more than a million pounds of ordnance on Iraqi targets. Their unmanned aerial vehicles had flown hundreds of hours of reconnaissance missions, and the battleships had also helped to clear naval mines. On February 23rd, the last day of hostilities, Wisconsin fired the last fire support mission of the Gulf War. It was the last time that a battleship's guns were fired in combat anywhere on Earth. The shots marked the end of the era of the battleship. Although they are no longer being maintained so that they could be brought into service, all four ships of the Iowa class have been preserved as museum ships. Over the course of their long careers, there was always a discussion about the cost of maintaining and crewing such large ships. Their successful deployment nearly 50 years after they were launched was a testament to the durability of their design, but things like missiles and aircraft and perhaps future weapons like railguns are thought now to be able to replace the fire support missions that were the last main role of the 16-inch guns of the Iowa class. And as time went on, it just became more and more expensive to try to maintain them or considering bringing them back into service. There were, there were no longer crew or shipyards with experience in their maintenance or their operation. Still, the great battleships and their great guns were a sign of national prestige, and they were a terror that intimidated an enemy. The battleships of the Iowa class earned 47 battle stars among them, and it is difficult to imagine a United States Navy without them.